this is Ben Kelly with the Endeavoring Orthodoxy podcast. Uh, today, I'm going to talk to you about uh, one of my favorite books and one of my favorite thinkers um, for the last few years, uh, The Word of God and the Mind of Man by the Christian philosopher Ronald Nash. Nash was uh, a Christian philosopher. He taught at Reformed Theological Seminary. He also taught at Southern Seminary. I think he has been dead for about 15 years, give or take. Don't quote me on that, but I believe he died in 2007. But what we're going to do today, and we are going, I know that I told you earlier in previous episodes, we were going to cover some topics that I had laid out. But I was listening to a different podcast over the weekend, um, New Discourses by James Lindsay. And uh, if you don't know who he is, it's not a big deal. If you do, he he talks a lot about uh, problems with philosophy having to deal with critical race theory, wokeism, you know, any kind of cultural Marxism. But what I really like about him, I don't agree with everything he says, but what I really like about his podcast is that he reads documents, he reads papers, he reads chapters and books, and then he explains them. And when I was deciding what this podcast would be like, I wanted to follow his model. And I've kind of gotten away from that over the summer and in these first few episodes back this season. And so I'm going to get back into that. I've, I've always done the best as far as stats go, as far as people listening and interacting with this. Um, if I read papers, read you know, journal articles, read chapters in books, and explain what's going on, because I feel like that is the most engaging content out there. Nobody really cares about my, my five reasons why I'm not a dispensationalist, for example. Uh, but uh, I feel like this is what I have to offer. I think I can do a good job of it. And so we're going to get back into that. So we're actually going to go through this book, The Word of God and the Mind of Man. The subtitle is The Crisis of Revealed Truth in Contemporary Theology. Uh, by Ronald Nash, who I was talking about. This book was written in, let me see here, I'm opening it up, 1982. And, you know, I had never heard of it before, even though I had followed Nash. And then I saw this book referenced in the footnotes of a book I was reading for school at one time. And I just thought, I really need to get a hold of that book because the, the title of it seems very interesting to me. Um, the title is actually off of, it's a play off of um, a another book, a much earlier book from about 50 years earlier by uh, the theologian Karl Barth, who wrote The Word of God and the Word of Man. And so this is kind of a refutation to some of the Barthian theology that we see, um, and not just Barth, but really a lot of um, evangelical theology over the last give or take 70 years uh, since after World War II is what he says in his book. So I'm going to read this. Uh, we're going we're to talk about it. Um, and the reason why I'm so interested is that this book really searches for answers about what is the extent of God's revelation and the extent of man's ability to know God's revelation. And so that's where we are. And so I'm going to read the preface the introduction in chapter one, and I have notes for that. I'm hoping to keep it under an hour. I really haven't timed myself, but feel well prepared. So let's get into it. The Word of God and the Mind of Man by Ronald H. Nash. You can get copies of this on Amazon pretty cheaply. And the preface says, the title of this book can be understood in at least two ways. First of all, the Word of God in the Mind of Man is an exploration of the extent to which the human mind can receive and understand divine revelation insofar as this revelation is understood to include the communication of truth. On a second and more fundamental level, the phrase, the Word of God, recalls its classical context, the prologue to John's Gospel and the classical Logos doctrine of the early church fathers, all human knowledge is possible because of the unique human participation and the eternal logos of God, Jesus Christ. So uh, just real quick, right after that first paragraph, this is not 
a new doctrine that Nash is bringing to our attention. In fact, it's a very old doctrine. Um, it goes way back, almost maybe to the second century, first and second century, actually, but probably second century. And he's talking about this as more of like a recovery theology, that this doctrine has been denied. Um, it was so well known in the church throughout early church history, the patristics, the medieval church, and even in the Reformation, uh, that it was never really developed and talked about much more than how it developed with the early church fathers. But now it's been kind of denied um, by liberal and modern wings of theology, and then it's creeping into evangelical theology. Um, you know, with some of the comments that I've made on this podcast, you're going to be able to make, to make sense of them much more now that I'm reading this book. But the the Logos Doctrine, what we will um, come to see later in the book is it's an argument about how Jesus being the Logos of God is a necessary condition uh, for understanding the existence of the world, for understanding human knowledge, and for understanding salvation. You know, we tend to focus on the salvific aspects of Christ being the divine Logos, but Nash is working to recover older theology that had more comprehensive understanding of the Logos, where, where our existence and our capabilities as rational beings are connected to Christ as the divine Logos. So continuing with Nash, some, some readers may also wonder if the affinity of the title is one of intentional, or is one of, oh, excuse me, let me start that again. Some readers may also wonder if the affinity to the title of one of Karl Barth's early books the Word of God and the Word of Man, is intentional. It is in the sense that the positions advocated in this book are offered in conscious opposition to those contemporary theologians who maintain that human words are incapable of carrying a cognitive Word of God. So what that means, BART and non-cognitive revelation, uh, or the non-cognitivist theologians, Bart, as well as many other theologians in the 20th century, put forth a theology that did not believe there was conscious intellectual activity happening in God's revelation. Bart would say that revelation is God revealing himself and his person to his people, and that does not include propositional facts about himself. It's, I know it's, it's kind of silly on the you know, on the face of it, but a lot of people embraced it. And, and I think there are some some more devious reasons, not so much for Barth's part, but, you know, when you get into some of the liberal or atheistic theologians and philosophers, I think there are some more devious reasons why they would adopt this kind of thinking. So this is one of the main points of contention that Nash will argue against throughout this book. So if you don't understand about this cognitive, non-cognitive stuff, don't worry hang on, we will get to it in, in more depth, and I will explain it better later, but we need to keep moving on. So he says, the views I explain and defend in this book are an important foundation of, of what has been the mainstream of evangelical thinking about divine revelation and religious epistemology since the end of World War II. It is the first book that attempts to trace this position back to its roots, a systematic examination of the theoretical foundations and historical development of this position is not available elsewhere. So he's kind of doing something new. Um, Carl Henry definitely talked about this a lot, but uh, Nash is definitely one who uh, went about trying to trace this, this, uh, this doctrine historically from a philosophical standpoint. And Carl Henry actually endorsed this book. So since many evangelicals are beginning to drift from the former consensus about the indispensability and the legitimacy of a belief in cognitive or propositional revelation, a fresh examination of this view and its major competition can be helpful at this particular time in the history of the church. So that's the preface. There's some other things in there about who he's going to thank for helping him write this and some some notes about chapter 6 and how it was originally a speech that he had given, but we're not going to read that. We're going to move on into the introduction. So the introduction, it's 
titled Introduction, The Unknown God. It reads, the last two centuries of Christian theology are the record of an evolving attack on the role of knowledge in the Christian faith. Following the lead of 18th century philosophers David Hume and Immanuel Kant, many modern theologians have questioned God's ability to communicate truth to man and undermine man's ability to attain knowledge about God. So there's there's two central issues here. Uh, modern theology and philosophy, they they question God's ability to reveal himself to humans, and they also question man's ability to know God. And so he continues, Gordon Kaufman typifies this agnostic attitude toward God, and this is Kaufman's quote, the real reference for God is never accessible to us or in any way open to our observation or experience. It must remain always an unknown X, a mere limiting idea with no content. It stands for the fact that God transcends our knowledge in modes and ways in which we can never be aware of and, or aware and of which we have no inkling. So this is this is famous type of argument that these guys will make that God is um, he so much transcends our knowledge that we just we he moves in such ways and he communicates in such ways that we cannot hope to understand. Kaufman does not stop with this suggestion. So this is back to this is back to Nash. Kaufman does not stop with this suggestion that the being referred to by the word God is an unknowable X. He adds, God is ultimately profound mystery and utterly escapes our every effort to grasp or comprehend him. Our concepts are at best metaphors and symbols of his being, not literally applicable. And I could go on and talk about that more and more. Uh, some of the things that I would have to say, even though I, I like uh, some of the things that Jordan Peterson says and some of his um, band of merry men that are talking about ideas and culture, I think they kind of get into this idea of metaphors and symbols of God's being rather than really knowing cognitively and propositionally God. So we, we could have an entire podcast on that, but that's one of the things to consider going on. Modern skepticism about the possibility of attaining knowledge about God is illustrated in the writings of philosopher W.T. Stace, who maintained that God is utterly and forever beyond the reach of the logical intellect or of any intellectual comprehension, and that in consequence, when we try to comprehend his nature intellectually, contradictions appear in our thinking. While Stace regarded himself as neither a theologian nor a Christian in the traditional sense, comments similar to his appear in the writings of many theologians. According to Stace, while God cannot be known by the human intellect, and this is quoting Stace, he can be known in direct religious or mystical experience. Perhaps this is much the same as saying that he can be known by faith but not by reason. Any attempt to reach God through logic, through the conceptual logical intellect, is doomed because up against an absolute barrier it is up against an absolute barrier but this does not mean the death of religion it does not mean that there is no possibility of that knowledge and communion with god which religion requires it means that the knowledge of god which is the essence of religion is not of an intellectual kind it is rather the direct experience of the mystic himself or if we were not mystics then it is whatever it is that you would call religious experience and this experience of God in the heart, shall we say, is not an intellectual understanding or explanation. This experience of God is the essence of religion. And so you guys have heard me talk about this stuff before. Experience becomes the predominant way we know God, according to philosophers and theologians that Nash is objecting to. All right, so that I don't need to go on there. You, I have previous podcasts about the problems with Christian mysticism, with Christian experience, with basing revelation and experience. This is this book is going to attack this. So continuing with Nash, so that, that long paragraph was all um, from Stace earlier. Continuing with Nash, what Kaufman and the Christian theologian and Stace, the non-Christian mystic, and thousands of theologians, seminary professors, and pastors share in common is the trivialization or repudiation of the traditional role that truth has played in Christian religion. Cognitive knowledge about God is simply declared impossible or replaced by personal encounter, religious feeling, trust, or obedience. 
in the words of John Bailey, John Bailey is a pretty famous theologian from the middle of the 20th century. In the words of John Bailey, God does not give us information by communication. He gives us himself in communion. It is not information about God that is revealed, but God himself. Or, as William Temple, another famous theologian of the same, almost the same period, as he once put it, actually William Temple is a little earlier, earlier 20th century, but, or as William Temple once put it, there is no such thing as revealed truth. What is offered to man's apprehension in any specific revelation is not truth concerning God, but the living God himself. So, that's what we're talking about here. This whole theology that has been developed about the revelation of God in the 20th century, it's not re, it's not revelation of God where God reveals propositions about himself, like, you know, God is good or something. He doesn't, his, what they're saying is, you know, the Bible doesn't reveal these truth propositions about God. Therefore, we cannot cognitively know him like that. Instead, God reveals his person himself, which we experience. That's the big change that they're drawing for. And I've, I've talked about this stuff before and why I'm, I'm so just set against this because I think it leads to such a mystical and psychological understanding about God and how he reveals himself to us that it really doesn't fit how scripture describes those things. Moving on. The theological agnosticism represented by Kaufman, Bailey, and Temple marks a dramatic break with a major tradition of historic Christianity, a tradition that affirmed both an intelligible revelation from God and the divinely given human ability, ability to know the transcendent God through the medium of true propositions. But this former confidence about God's ability to communicate information and the God-given human ability to receive that information has been shaken. The possibility of human knowledge about God has been denied on at least three grounds. The first is some have precluded knowledge about God on the basis of particular theories about the nature of human knowledge. Others have been led to agnosticism because their view of nature of, of the nature of God. For example, some have exaggerated the divine transcendence that the holy other God of whom they speak could not possibly be an object of human knowledge. Third, Still others have affirmed the impossibility of knowledge about God because of theories about the nature of human language. They regard human language as incapable of serving as an adequate carrier of information about God. So three things going on there, three kind of doubts that have shaken the classical or traditional view of God revealing himself and the human ability to know God. The first is the nature of human knowledge. Humans don't have the right kind of knowledge to know God. They don't, they, we don't gather knowledge in the right way. Um, the second is the nature of God. God is wholly other, and so um, he is not like us really in any way. Therefore, we can't know him in any way. So that we would call that uh, the, uh, really, we would have a discussion on divine transcendence and divine eminence, you know. How far, how far off is God and how close is he to us? These theologians would argue that he's so far off, he's so wholly other that we really can't know him in that way. And the third one, the nature of human language, it's impossible for us to communicate information about God, usually because he's so wholly other. So a lot of times those two will be used together. So continuing. One of the fundamental postulates of contemporary non-evangelical theory, then, is the claim that God cannot reveal truth to us. And even if God could speak, humans are considered incapable of understanding whatever God might be attempting to say. The human relationship to God must therefore be understood according to a model other than that of receiving information or truth. It must be understood in an inward personal experience with God. No evangelical theologian denies the importance of a human encounter with the living God, but it is appropriate to question the consequences of divorcing the experience of God from cognitive knowledge about God. And you can do that with any relationship in your life. Think about it. So I have a wife. I experience my wife, and I know her that way, 
but I also know a great deal of cognitive information about her. What what happens to that relationship? What are the consequences of that relationship if I have no cognitive understanding, cognitive knowledge, if I don't know truth propositions about my wife? It, it turns out to be a very strange relationship, maybe a very deteriorated uh, relationship. And so magnify that by a thousand with a human relationship with God, and you'll get something that doesn't even look like Christianity, to be quite honest. So. Let's continue. The purpose of this book is to challenge the major forms of Christian agnosticism and offer an alternative theory that makes human knowledge about God possible. The theory is not new. In fact, it is a return to the classical Logos doctrine that played such a prominent role in the thinking of many early Christians. The view gained, this view gained such influence in Christian thought that centuries after it ceased to be discussed explicitly, it continued to control theological thinking about divine revelation and human capacity to know God. This is certainly evident in the writings of St. Augustine, who seldom mentions the Logos doctrine as such, but whose entire approach to a Christian theory of knowledge is grounded on the doctrine. So that's, uh, and Nash would know he wrote another book on uh, Augustine's theory of knowledge. And so what we, what we get here is this, it is appropriate to question the consequences of divorcing, you know, experiencing God from cognitive propositional knowledge of God. And what it usually leads to is speculation. Nash is trying to recover an older theology that has been lost in the church today. In a sense, all of the issues to be discussed in this book reduce to one fundamental question. Can the human Logos know the Logos of God? In other words, is there a relationship between the human mind and the divine mind that is sufficient to ground the communication of truth from God to humans? There is no doubt in Christian thought that such a relationship exists and that such knowledge is possible, or it was possible until alien theories of knowledge gained ascendancy in the decades after human Kant. This book is a counterattack to the prevailing agnosticism of contemporary Christian theology. Like Carl Henry, we wish to emphasize, and this is a quote from Henry, the God of the Bible is a rational God, that the divine logos is central to the Godhead and is the agent in creation and redemption, that man was made in the divine image for intelligible communion with God, that God communicates his purposes and truths about himself in the biblical revelation, that the Holy Spirit uses truth as a means of persuasion and conviction, and that Christian experience includes not simply a surrender of the will, but a rational assent to the truth of God. And that's when we talk about faith, and I'm, I'm thinking about reading through Nash's book on Augustine to talk about the theory of knowledge, because we talk about, Augustine talks about faith as both rational assent and a surrender of the will. It's not merely just a surrender of the will. Usually that kind of faith is, um, it's weak. And, and this is a quote, that, that was a quote from a paper Carl Henry uh, wrote called Reply to the God is Dead Mavericks. Um, he wrote it for Christianity Today. And we're actually going to look at uh, one of one of Henry's papers in a coming week, I believe. So talking about a similar issue. There's an, and this is back to Nash. There is nothing in the nature of the divine transcendence that precludes the possibility of our knowing the mind of God. There is nothing irrational or illogical about the content of divine revelation. The Christian God is not the unknown God of ancient Athens or modern Marburg. He is a God who created men and women as creatures capable of knowing his mind and will, and who has made information about his mind and will available in revealed truths. When modern theologians claim that the word of God and the human mind are incompatible, they advance a position for which the world still awaits adequate argumentation. The case for this position has not yet been made. It has been advanced on the basis of questionable premises and drastic oversimplifications, misunderstandings, or misrepresentations of the evangelical position. And that's what he's going to attack, all these misunderstandings and misrepresentations. The fact that this agnosticism has been proposed by many who thought they were doing 
Christianity a favor is essentially irrelevant. Many proponents of the view did indeed believe that they were making a defense of Christianity easier by rejecting knowledge in order to make room for faith. Theologians like Bruner, that's Emil Bruner, Tillich, Paul Tillich, and Boltman, Rudolf Boltman, sincerely believed that they that their view would make it easier for moderns to enter into a genuine relationship with God. God or good intentions do not guarantee sound theology. The inevitable implications of this position are destructive of historic Christianity. So um, many theologians, he named some of them here, Emil Bruner, Paul Tillich, Rudolf Boltman, many theologians of the modern era sought to make Christianity more palatable to the modern human mind. And, it, and I'm going to use this word a lot, modern, and I need to explain explain what that means because when I say modern, that doesn't mean the exact same thing as contemporary. A lot of times we use those as synonymous, but when if I'm talking about theology and I say modern the, modern theologians or or modern era theologians. What I mean is the modern era, the era that is in theology that is characterized by liberalism and this extreme, just agnostic theology that we can't know God. There's also postmodern theology, which is a whole new basket of problems, but I'm talking about this is very much a refutation of some modern theologians, not contemporary necessarily but those who thought like the, those of the modern era. So modern theologians, they, they attempted to re-explain God's revelation through personal encounter, which, is usually, uh, which usually took all intellectual content out of the doctrine of revelation, and it put it squarely in the space of personal experience. And what Nash is going to do from this point, that was the end of the introduction, What he's going to do at this point is he's going to show how major philosophers, primarily David Hume and Immanuel Kant, how their philosophies led to this type of thinking. So to finish up tonight, we are actually going to read through the chapter on Hume. It's very short. It's only five, six pages, yeah, six and a half. So we'll get through it. I've got fewer notes on it. But I want you to understand Hume tonight so that we can uh, move on and cover uh, maybe Kant next week. We also may be looking at a article by Carl Henry. So let's continue with Hume. Chapter 1, it's titled Hume's Gap, the Divorce of Faith and Knowledge. The writings of David Hume, like those of Immanuel Kant, are a watershed in the history of philosophy and theology. Hume's ideas on religion are found primarily in the last three sections of his inquiry concerning human understanding, section 10 being his famous essay on miracles, his di- his classic dialogues concerning natural religion, and in several shorter essays on subjects such as suicide, immortality, and the natural history of religion. Urged by several friends, including some clergy- clergymen, Hume agreed to delay the publication of the dialogues until after his death. His death. They contain a profound and, as it turned out, influential analysis of the empirical arguments for God's existence, especially the argument from design. Among students of Hume's thought, they are, there are also notorious, or they are also notorious for their ambiguity regarding Hume's final position. Much of Hume's notoriety among Christians results from a less than careful reading of his works. Hume is commonly believed to, believe to have attacked the foundations of Christianity, such as the existence of God, personal survival after death, and miracles. It is true that Hume's personal beliefs about many Christian doctrines did not mirror the orthodox Calvinism that surrounded him in his early youth. What Hume intended in his writings is often quite removed from what his interpreters have thought. Hume's major threat to Christianity comes not from the theories for which he gained notoriety, but rather from his espousal of a a notion that has, in fact, become widely held in Christendom. Before Hume's position on the subject is discussed, some general remarks about the philosophical background of Hume's teaching may be helpful. So what he's going to do is he's, he's saying is that a lot of people think they know what Hume taught, 
a lot of people think that Hume was an atheist or an outright skeptic, when really Hume was more of what we would call an epistemological skeptic. He he did not believe we had the ability to know certain things. He 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 never outright came out and said there is no God or anything like that. He questioned if there was even a God, how would we know um, he exists? We don't have the ability to know. So let me continue here. There are three common misconceptions about Hume's philosophy. The first, Hume denied the reality of causal relationships that there is, ne there is ever a necessary connection between the prior event we call cause and the subsequent event we call its effect. So uh, they, people will say Hume denied cause and effect. He didn't. Two, that Hume rejected the existence of what philosophers call the external world. That is, that he doubted the existence of a real world outside of his mind. Hume, it is claimed, was a solipsist or a skeptic. So in, in one sense, I, I've already said Hume is an epistemological skeptic in one sense. Um, here, Nash is making the point that Hume is not an absolute you know, ontological skeptic or, or metaphysical skeptic. He doesn't believe that, you know, you can't know anything outside your own mind. He does believe that, but some people, some people attributed that belief to him, that you can't know anything outside of your own mind, and that's just not what Hume believed. Three, that Hume doubted the, ev the existence of what philosophers call the self, that is the real I, the foundation of a person's identity through time. So Hume didn't deny that either. These three erroneous claims make up what might be called the philosophical package. What led to their um, promulgation was a bearing on one of Hume's key doctrines, and through that doctrine is linked to the central concern of this chapter. So let me see here. <clears throat> I don't really need it. So the philosophical package came to be attributed to Hume because of the writings of two of his fellow, fellow Scotsmen, Thomas Reed and James B who became famous for their defense of common sense against the supposed skepticism of Hume. Now, Reed and Beatty do make a good argument for what they would call common sense realism, and I don't want to get into that today. I don't have time to, but um, they do have, they, they have a good philosophy. They built it on a false attack um, against Hume. Reed and Beatty believe that Hume had simply borrowed some premises from the empiricism of two e earlier British philosophers, John Locke and George Berkeley, and had extended those doctrines to their logical but bitter end, namely, total skepticism about God, the world, and the self. But Hume's entire enterprise was quite different from that what Reed and Beattie um, imagined. According to Hume, everyone holds to a number of pivotal beliefs around which most other beliefs, individual actions, and social institutions turn. These pivotal beliefs include the reality of causal relations, that some things can and do cause changes in other things, the reality of the external world, that the existence of the world does not depend upon it being perceived, and the continuing existence of the knowing self. Hume had no quarrel with these beliefs. It would be fundamentally foolish, um, he believed, to doubt them. What most concerned Hume was how these beliefs come to be known. Again, we're talking about epistemology. How do we know what we know? Hume showed that neither reason nor experience is sufficient to ground a knowledge of these matters. So reason and experience are not sufficient to ground any kind of knowledge of causal relations, the existence of the external world, which would include the existence of God, and the existence of the self. Hume's saying we can't use reason um, or experience to sufficiently ground knowledge for those things. But there simply is no other way for them to be known. Therefore, if these pivotal beliefs cannot be known by reason and experience, they cannot be known at all. It is at this point that Reed and Beattie made one of their mistakes. They jumped to the conclusion that Hume was actually denying these pivotal beliefs. They were wrong. Hume was denying that there is, there is any sense in which uh, that there is any sense in which we can be said to know these things, but this is a far cry from saying that we should doubt them. What would be the height of folly, or that would be the height of folly? Obviously, we must continue to believe them since the consequences of not believing are too absurd to contemplate. So, so again, 
Hume believes that these are, you know, pivotal beliefs that we can't supply evidence for, and it would be foolish for us to give them up. And no one has to force or persuade us to believe them. Believing them is the natural thing to do. With the last observation, we begin to approach Hume's basic point. Hume tried to show that most of our pivotal beliefs about reality are matters that human reason is powerless to prove or support. And this is where we get to what we call Hume's gap. Hume was really doing two things. First, he was attacking the supremacy of human reason, one of the cardinal tenets of the Enlightenment, by seeking to show that human reason has definite limits. All who attended to extend reason beyond its limits become involved in absurdities and contradictions beyond, and become prone to the disease of skepticism. So philosophers have been entirely too optimistic in this, let's see, in assessing excuse me, the claims of human reason. Hume believed, or that's what Hume believed, most of the important things we think we know are not known at all. That is, they have not been arrived at on the basis of reasoning, and they are not supported by experience. Hume's second point was that these pivotal beliefs rest on something other than reason and experience, namely on instinct, habit, or custom. Some non-rational inner force compels us to accept these pivotal beliefs. In his writings on ethics also, Hume argued that moral judgments rest not on reason but on non-rational human nature. In ethics, as in metaphysics and religion, hum, or human reason is and ought to be the slave of human passion, that is, our non-rational nature. This is tantamount to the claim that we cannot have knowledge about the transcendent. This axiom is the foundation of what I call Hume's Gap. So what's going on here? Hume's Gap. What he's saying is that we as humans cannot have knowledge about God because God is not something we can reason to or gather empirical information about. The only true type of knowledge... <coughs> The only two true type of knowledge is that which we can gather or reason to. And so theology, according to Hume, is completely regulated to the realm of faith. It's something that we take by custom, by instinct. It's not something that we can gather experience for or we can reason to. And he's, he's putting a huge, a huge gap between human knowledge and divine revelation, what God has revealed about himself. He's putting that gap there so that we can't know God in any kind of really rational way. If Hume was a skeptic, then he was not one in James Beattie's sense of the word. Hume did not doubt the existence of the world. As Hume saw it, this kind of skepticism is absurd because it contradicts common sense and violates our natural instinct to believe against all reasoning in certain propositions. Nature, instinct, and common sense all lead us to believe in an external world. According to Hume, we should ignore the arguments of the rationalists and trust our instincts. He believed that investigation ought to be limited to areas such as mathematics where knowledge is possible. Skip speculative knowledge claims about certain topics in metaphysics, theology, and ethics should be avoided. Such matters should be accepted on the basis of faith, not knowledge. So there's a clear gap between faith and knowledge being put up there, where Hume is going to say that we don't, we don't know these metaphysical theological claims based on real rational or in, um, empirical knowledge. It's all based on instinct or custom. And so, again, he's really putting a gap between faith and knowledge. Hume's religious beliefs are, for the most part, an extension of the position just outlined. But some blatant distortions of his religious position should be rejected. It is sometimes thought that Hume was an atheist, that he attempted to prove God does not exist, and that he argued that miracles are impossible. To be sure, Hume was not a Christian in the New Testament sense of the word. He did not believe in miracles, which is, however, something quite different from trying to prove them impossible. He did not personally believe in special revelation or immortality or religious duties like prayer. But he was not an atheist. He did not attempt to prove the non-existence of God. And he certainly never argued that miracles are impossible. This claim will surprise some readers. Hume's famous attack on miracles really amounts to the assertion that no one could ever reasonably believe that a miracle occurred. 
Hume believed in the existence of a divine mind that was in some way unknown or some unknown way responsible for the order of the universe. So again, Hume believes in a divine mind and this divine mind is responsible for the ordering of the universe, but we can't know it. Why? Because metaphysical theological claims, propositions, they are relegated to faith, not rational or empirical knowledge. Hume was both shocked and amused by the dogmatic atheism of the French philosophers. Their mistake was the same as that of the Orthodox Calvinists. Each thought they could obtain knowledge about the transcendent, but unlike the Calvinists, the philosophers thought this knowledge would justify their conclusion that a transcendent being did not exist. It would have been inconsistent for Hume to attempt to disprove God's existence. His point was that we cannot have any knowledge about God, but it is entirely natural to have faith that God exists. In fact, the same nature that compels us to hold the pivotal beliefs mentioned earlier leads us to believe in the existence of God. So Hume could have been, you know, quite at home, you know, in some evangelical churches today that divorce these ideas of knowledge and faith coming together because he thinks he, he believed in a divine mind that was the creator and order of all existence, yet he didn't believe we could have any knowledge. Well, he might have been right at home with certain types of Christians who believe we only understand everything by faith, that there's no rational consent, anything like that. So, continuing, but nature does not compel us to go beyond this basic belief in God's existence and accept the theological claims added by orthodoxy. Those theological claims must be rejected because they go beyond the limits of human knowledge. He's describing Hume's thought here. To argue, as many Christians do, that reason can prove the existence of God or that reason can infer many of the divine attributes from features of the world and that the Christian religion, or any religion for that matter, is supported by miraculous events is to exceed the bounds of human knowledge. These claims, according to Hume, must be rejected, as must the many assertions that Christians make about God in their creeds Items allegedly derived from special revelation. So Hume wants to get rid of all of it. Get rid of all the revelation. It, it, it goes above and beyond what human reason has the ability to know about God. So again, we're seeing that divide. We're, we're seeing the seeds of what we talked about earlier, how we can only know God through our experience. We don't know him propositionally, cognitively. We're seeing the seeds of that planted in a skeptical anti-Christian per se philosopher from a couple hundred years earlier. Without doubt, some Christians have overestimated the ability of human reason with respect to quote-unquote proofs about God's existence. I have no desire to attempt any defense of that use of reason. More serious, however, is Hume's denial of the possibility of any knowledge about God in general and the possibility of revealed knowledge in particular. To summarize, Hume's goal in his discussion of religion was the same as his objective in philosophy. He wished to show that reason is powerless to convert anyone to the claims of faith. To be a philosophical skeptic, he wrote, is the first and most essential step towards being a sound, believing Christian. So you have to be skeptical about your theological um, understandings. You have to be skeptical about any kind of uh, rational reasoning towards God in order to be a good, sound-believing Christian. Hume's own preferences seem to have been for a non-rational faith in a God unsupported by reason, revelation, miracles, or evidence of any kind. With this background, the nature of what I earlier referred to as Hume's gap can now be identified. Hume's gap is the rejection of the possibility of a rational knowledge of God and objective religious truth. Hume grounded man's belief in God in man's non-rational nature. Hume was a precursor to those philosophers and theologians who insist that religious faith must be divorced from the knowledge or from knowledge and who believe that the impossibility of knowledge about God will in some way enhance faith. Like Kant, Hume has engaged in denying knowledge in order to make room for faith. Both Hume and Kant, or to both Hume and Kant, knowledge and faith have nothing in common. The arrogance of rational religion must 
be destroyed so that faith, a non-rational faith that is, can assume its proper place as the only legitimate ground for religion. Hume's gap appears prominently in the thought of a great many modern thinkers. Again, remember my use of modern. The contemporary eclipse of God can be seen in Sartre's Silence of God, in Heidegger's Absence of God, in Jasper's Concealment of God, in Boltman's Hiddenness of God, in Tillich's Non-Being of God, and finally, in Radical Theology's assertion of the death of God. St. Paul's sermon to the philosophers on Mars Hill, which is Acts 17, concerning worship of the unknown God is all too relevant to the contemporary theological scene. Non-evangelical theology, since Hume, is a chronicle of futile attempts to retain respectability for religious faith while denying religion any right to reveal truth. Let me read that sentence again. Non-evangelical theology, and we're going to include some evangelicals in this, non-evangelical theology since Hume, and Hume is writing around the time of the American Revolution, for those of you who don't know, since Hume is a chronicle of futile attempts to retain respectability for religious faith while denying religion any right to reveal truth. In Paul Tillich's version, Paul Tillich is a mid-20th century theologian. He's kind of crazy. Uh, just, I, I don't understand half of what he's talking about. But for those of you who, who would like a better understanding of some of these philosophers and theologians and how they relate to the development of theology, especially in the 20th century, I would suggest getting Roger Olson's book, The Journey of Modern Theology, from Reconstruction to Deconstruction. A lot of Christians, they understand, they'll understand a, a sense of the early church fathers, maybe some medieval theology. Protestants definitely understand Reformation and post-Reformation theology like the Puritans. But when you get to about 1800, they just don't know anything about what's happened. They might know a few different theologians from that time period, from especially from the 1800s, but they really don't understand the development of theology past 1800. Olson's book will help you understand that. So let me keep going. In Paul Tillich's version of Hume's thesis, all that is left of Christianity is a religion that is neither objective, rational, miraculous, supernatural, nor even personal. Apparently, about the only thing non-evangelicals can agree about is that God has not spoken and indeed cannot speak. Neo-Orthodox theology, because of its outspoken denial of cognitive revelation, is not an exception. So Neo-Orthodox theology is the theology of Karl Barth, Emil Bruner. While contemporary non-evangelicals have virtually reduced faith to courageous ignorance, and that's a term from a, a um, paper written by Carl Henry called Justification by Ignorance, I think we will read that paper in this long discussion. It's, it's very good. Evangelicals have hardly been faithful in defending God's objective communication of truth. Hume's gap has infected modern orthodoxy to the extent that many evangelicals are either ignoring or de-emphasizing the cognitive dimension of divine revelation. A new anti-intellectualism threatens contemporary evangelicalism. It is evident in much evangelical, in much evangelical disregard for the revealed truth of God and in the effort by some evangelicals to substitute other concerns for that truth. Christian anti-intellectualism may be manifested in a variety of ways, in a contempt for creeds, in a search for God through the emotions, in a dependence upon some kind of mystical experience. Hume would be comfortable in many contemporary churches, for he would not hear the truth of God proclaimed and defended. He would hear stories and testimonies that appeal to the emotions. Let me read that again. Hume would be comfortable in many contemporary churches, for he would not hear the truth of God proclaimed and defended. He would hear stories and testimonies that appeal to the emotions. So one of the greatest opponents of Orthodox Christian belief over the last 300 years, and we're going to say that, hey, he would fit right in in evangelical churches today, and some of them, we got a problem. I want to read this, this little footnote from Nash here. He 
He says, I'm not impugning the value of emotions and religious experience and the quest for religious truth. My target is those who set these up as alternatives to reason and insist that we must not rationally reflect on our experiences and emotions. So he's not saying we need to jettison emotion or experience, but those who set it up as kind of an antithesis and reject it for emotion and experience, there's a problem there. Hume might even be welcomed as a professor in some evangelical theological seminaries. He would find acceptance among the religious irrationalists of the day who hold that the quotient of faith increases as its rational content decreases. So your quotient of faith increases as its rational content de decreases. I know some Christians like that. The most obvious consequence of Hume's gap is a minimal theism. Once Hume's stance is adopted, New Testament Christianity with its proclamation of divine of a divine Christ whose death and resurrection secured redemption from sin and gave hope beyond the grave must be replaced with a religion that talks about how good it feels to have an experience with God about whom nothing definite can be known. Let me let me read that again. That is that is an incredible incredible couple sentences. Once Hume's stance is adopted New Christianity, with its proclamation of a divine Christ whose death and resurrection secured redemption from sin and gave hope beyond the grave, must be replaced with a religion that talks about how good it feels to have an experience with a God about whom nothing definite can be known. The threat to Christianity today from the legacy of David Hume is not a full-fledged frontal assault upon Christian theism with all the troops advancing in full light of day. That kind of attack would fail because it would arouse Christians to a rational defense of their faith. David Hume's legacy is more insidious. It undermines the faith not by denying it, but by directing our attention away from the importance of its knowledge claims and its truth content. So, that's, that's the end of that chapter. You know, you get a sense right from early modern philosophy philosophy, David Hume, talking about how we divorce faith and knowledge. So we're going to continue reading this book. I, I, I love doing this. I like looking at documents and getting into the meat of that stuff and talking about it and explaining it. I feel that this is, this is a better model for a podcast. And so, um, you know, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. Otherwise, may God bless you. Keep reading. May the Spirit illuminate you. Have a great day.